more than any other tank of World War II, the German Tiger tank, with its almost impenetrable armor and highly accurate 88 millimeter gun, instilled fear in the hearts of Allied soldiers. They killed two of my crew, and I was literally blown out of the top. Outnumbered in nearly every battle, the highly trained and courageous Tiger crews were the elite of Germany's crack panzer troops. It was a great thing to be in a Tiger. And of course, we felt superior. Using archive film and color reenactments, Battle Stations enters the world of one of the finest armored vehicles in the history of tank warfare, the Tiger tank. In 1916, the British Army was the first to introduce tanks on the battlefield. At the time, Germany showed little or no interest in the revolutionary new tank. After their defeat in World War I, however, many German officers became convinced that when Germany rose again, the tank would play a major role. The Treaty of Versailles had banned all armament production in post-war Germany. Early development of German tanks during the 1920s and 30s had to be carried out in secret. But once Hitler and the Nazis came to power, all pretense of secrecy was thrown aside. Germany had built its army into a mighty fighting machine that would conquer almost the entire continent of Europe. Large tank formations, known as Panzer Divisions, were to be its main striking force. General Heinz Guderian, one of the leading strategists in the German army, created Germany's Panzer Divisions. His ideas on the deployment and use of tanks in modern warfare earned him the title Father of the Panzers. Heinz Guderian studied armored warfare between World War I and World War II and was able to take rather nebulous ideas and condense them down into a formal doctrine. Armies operate on doctrine, and Guderian is the father of armored warfare doctrine. At the time, the acknowledged leader in the principles of mechanization was British tank pioneer Major General John Fuller. Fuller was an eccentric genius whose ideas on tanks and mechanization earned him an international reputation, particularly in Germany. My father's role model was Fuller. He also studied other people's ideas on tanks. But the British already had, at the beginning of the 1920s, a tank brigade which we based our army's panzer divisions on. So it was the British who were his main role model. Ironically, Major General Fuller's ideas were never adopted by either the British, French, or the Americans, who all believed in the supremacy of infantry and artillery rather than the tank. General Guderian, however, clearly appreciated the decisive role that armored divisions would play in future conflicts. He saw tanks as providing crucial mobility in an attack. He developed the use of tanks as the main weapon in a division. Not like the French, who spread their tanks over several divisions instead of concentrating them in one key point. With this concept of key point concentration in panzer divisions, we entered the war and had our success. Hitler's panzer divisions were put to the test in 1939, when they spearheaded the German invasion of Poland. Enemy resistance collapsed within six weeks. The following year, the Germans turned west to attack the British and French. The superior tactics of the panzers just sliced through the enemy lines with almost laughable ease, despite the fact the Allies had more tanks. In June 
1941, Hitler again unleashed his panzers, this time on the Soviet Union. Within weeks, the Red Army was pushed back to the gates of Moscow. The victorious panzer division seemed indestructible. They considered their tanks superior to anything the enemy could produce. But in the autumn of 1941, the Germans were taken by complete surprise when the Russians deployed a new tank. Developed in great secrecy, the Russian T-34 outgunned and outperformed the German panzers. Soon the T-34 appeared. And that was an amazing surprise for us, because we didn't know that this vehicle existed. The T-34 turned out to be an equal opponent indeed, and we struggled quite a bit against it. The first appearance of the T-34 had not only inflicted severe losses on the German tanks, it deeply shocked the high command. They knew that once the T-34 went into mass production, defeat would be a very real possibility. Hitler was furious at this setback. He ordered his designers to build a bigger and better tank that would level the playing field. He became personally involved in setting out the specifications, which included a high-velocity gun, thick armor, and a top speed of 30 miles per hour. Early prototypes of this new tank, designated the Panzer Mark VI, were quickly built by established German companies, Mann, Daimler-Benz, Henschel, and Porsche. By 1942, only two front runners were left in the race, Porsche and Henschel. Both companies prepared a demonstration of their tanks on Hitler's birthday, April 20th. Dr. Ferdinand Porsche was a personal friend of the Fuhrer, so it was annoying for both of them to discover the Henschel design was clearly better. Of the three basic characteristics of any tank, firepower, armor, and mobility, the German designers favored firepower. So in response to Hitler's directive, Henschel decided upon a turret and 88 millimeter gun designed by Krupp, the German steel manufacturers. Two months later, the new super tank was finally ready for combat trials. To match its performance, it was named the Tiger. At 56 tons, the Tiger was nearly 20 tons heavier than its nearest rival. Yet despite its size, it had to cross difficult terrain and negotiate obstacles better than any Allied tank. Adolf Hitler was